But here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> but here's Losing the my job thing. is a small price thing. to pay when God's name is being glorified. <laughs> but here's the and he Losing will always make his small name price known. To pay when God's name is being glorified. <laughs> and he will always make his name known. I share this story with you. I share this story with you because what happened to me is, is just a small example of something that's happening on a much larger scale. I share, I share this story with you. Aunt Jemima I share this story canceled. with you because what happened to me is And, and if you didn't know, Nancy Green, the original version of Aunt Jemima, she was a picture of the American dream. She was a freed slave who went on and, and if you to be the face of the Nancy pancake Green, syrup that we love and, and have in our pantries today. Um, she fought for equality. And now the leftist mob is trying to erase her legacy. And might I mention how privileged we are as a nation if our biggest concern is a bottle of pancake syrup. And more recently, we're seeing a call for statues of Jesus Christ to be torn down. Now, I'm a little confused here because last week Jesus was a social justice warrior and this week he's, a, he's the face of white supremacy. And Jimmy Kimmel has been calling our president racist for years and it turns out he's the racist. There's, there's governors that are getting away with wearing blackface. That's just sliding under the radar. So I wanna encourage you all to stand firm in your beliefs. We need truth, we need hard, cold facts and truth now more than we ever have before, and we are so blessed to have a president who stands on the front lines, walks through the fire every day to fight for our God-given American freedoms. Do not apologize to the mob. And thank you, President Trump.
only ask this audience tonight to continue to be respectful and give each and every candidate the same opportunity to provide clarity in their response. Thank you. Mr. Lockhart Hughes, you can go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, for me, a path to sustainable development in Angolan context starts with education. That should be the first pillar. And the reason why I said this um, is the actual way that we give the students education in Anguilla requires a reform. Because when we talk about sustainable uh, development economies, it goes through the uh, TV, TVET uh, programs. Uh, you can look at China and, and you can even look at places uh, like Singapore. Uh, through the sustainable development, they started all with uh, the technical advancements. And TVET is the first place where, place where it must start. And if you're getting our people trained in positions where they can go on to have the top paying jobs in Anguilla, it also keeps, uh, keeps money in our economy. And that is the next uh, area that I'd like to touch. Uh, foreign direct investment into Anguilla, uh, foreign direct investment on a whole is not a bad thing. The issue with foreign direct investment is that if it's leaving the shores at the same speed that it's coming in, then you have an issue. So foreign direct investment coming in, our people at the top paying jobs, we're able to keep this money in our economy, which will create jobs, create um, advancements for, for employment and business. And now we speak about fishing as well. Fishing is another very good development, uh, sustainable development, sorry, for Anguilla. And if you talk about exploring the 200 nautical miles, uh, we have found within the first 100 miles, nautical miles that is, that there's a rare fish that can be so sold outside of Anguilla. Uh, and um, the issue with that is the processing and handling that, that starts first. So it comes back to education as well, full circle. And um, being with the fishing industry, it will actually create uh, uh, import, it will create an export component or import. And this is an area that I, that I believe, not believe, sorry, this is an area that we definitely have to explore going forward. And um, it, it should be also hinge with, uh, yes. also hinge with uh, renewable energies. Uh, renewable energies for, for sure will be at any pillar, any center of development and sustainable development. Um, it costs very much to start renewables, to be honest with you. But as you go along with renewable energy, it pays for itself down the road. But the, the point is that it's all about sustainability. So eventually when, when it gets to the point where we can lower the bills, it will be sustainable. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lockhart Hughes. Mr. Kyle Hodge, you Sustain have a chance yeah. to answer. Thank you. Sustainable development in the Anguillian context, to me, means making sure that, that our people are not living paycheck to paycheck. It means making sure that our people have access to, to good paying jobs. It means that we, we allow them to access education, and when they are educated, and when they are skilled up, that they have the, the opportunity to, to be able to, to man these posts. It also means reducing the cost of living in Anguilla. You know, we, we constantly hear the talk about minimum wage, but what's minimum wage when the cost of living is continuing to rise? So even if we work at rising, raising the minimum wage, we have to do something to, to adjust the cost of living. So sustainable development in the Anguillian context, it also means eradication of, of poverty and hunger and making sure that, that you know, our neighbor and, and our friends and families are well taken care of. It's about living as, as, as one people in, in this little rock of Anguilla. Um, it's also about empowerment and opportunity for all, and you know, looking at our food import bill and finding ways to, to reduce the high cost that we, we send overseas to feed ourselves. We got to reach to a point where, where we can start to feed ourselves and not depend solely on the outer world to feed us. COVID-19 has proven that we have to start to do a lot more things locally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyle Hodge. Now we have the opportunity for candidates to give a rebuttal or share further information on the question or topic that was raised. And we'll start, you have a maximum of two minutes to respond. And we'll start with Mr. Mark Romney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
uh, in my opening statement, I did reference uh, population growth. And I just want to reemphasize why I made that in my opening statement is the fact that with an increased population, we would then be able to better distribute the costs because more population, then we'd be able to carry the costs at a much lower rate. But in um, increasing the population, it is very important that we attract the right type of people. And by that, I mean, in terms of if you're going to expand our population, I think first and foremost, we will want to ensure that we have all our overseas nationals, that is the Anguillians who are resident overseas, to have them come home in the first um, go. And then we will seek to expand that to non-Anguillians. But I just want to make note of a couple things as it relates to, for example, I heard about low-cost water. And I, I can speak to that very quickly in the sense that having served with the Water Corporation of Angola as the deputy director, uh, we went from a position of no water production to water production. And what I will say at this point is that we did set the plane for the conversion to renewable energy with the new um, osmosis plant that was installed. It has that capability. So we were thinking long term in that regard because we do recognize that when it comes to the utilities, in particular when it's electricity and water, those are the more significant utilities in terms of the costs, and therefore we have to look at the lowest possible um, delivery in terms, of, in terms of delivering those services at the lowest possible cost for the benefit of all Anguillians. And I just want to touch, uh, and I spoke of economic diversification, in light of COVID-19 in particular, Thank we you, do Mr. know. Sorry. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark Romney, for your rebuttal. Ms. Hodge, you can go ahead. Thank you. So I spoke about um, responsible population growth, and my fellow candidate, um, Mr. Romney, he mentioned bringing fellow Anguillians back home. And I've heard this issue be touted quite a number of times. But how feasible is that? I do believe that is more feasible if we recognize and the skill sets that are within our people in the diaspora and utilize them where they are in the building of our nation from where they are. Because sometimes it is very difficult to have them to give up where they are and to come back and give back if our population cannot sustain what it is that they do. And for example, and I'm just going to do this very briefly, we have spoken so much about um, vessels that go missing at sea right here in Anguilla, yet we have an Anguillian that works with NASA who deals specifically with locating vessels that go missing and, um, yes, and coordinating with the search and rescue teams with the Coast Guard. If we can utilize those skills from where they are without asking them to give up that, we would be in a better position. I wanted to also go on and speak about investing in our human capital so that we can have more persons like Mr. Hodge who's working in NASA. And most importantly, there is no sustainable development if we do not have a healthy nation. A healthy nation is a wealthy nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hodge. Mr. Kennedy Hodge, you have the floor. I just want to say quickly, it's, it's uh, five of us and it might be a long night, so I just want to say quickly that I've always heard that 25,000 uh, was basically the minimum population that, that would make a country self-sustaining. And when, Anguilla, when Anguilla's population was 6,500, the BVI's population was 6,500 thereabouts. When Anguilla's was 7,000 plus, BVI was 7,000, British Virgin Islands was 7,000 plus. When Angola's was 9,000, BVI's was 9,000. When Angola's hit 13,000, BVI was 30,000, 30,000 in the space of the between the 10 year censuses. And so we can learn from what others have done. BVI has not lost their character. I was there recently. 
They've not lost their character, still very, very much the British Virgin Islands, but they somehow got their population to grow from 9,000 to 30,000, and we can learn from their example. And BVI, the people in the government in BVI, a lot of them are Anguillians. Former Premier um, Orlando Smith, uh, his wife is uh, my sister and the cousin of the APM's party leader, Dr. Ellis Lorenzo Webster. Uh, Mark Vanterpool, a member of the House and former minister down there, uh, is, is my brother. And so we have lots of people in the BVI in senior office that we can connect with right here in Anguilla and help us to get back on our track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Lockhart Hughes, so you, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My colleague also mentioned, I uh, would like to add more to the debate. Uh, the co my colleague mentioned about uh, agriculture in Anguilla. And one of the ideas that I see should be uh, looked at for sustainability, when we speak about sus subsistence farming, uh, the use of uh, recycling gray water systems would be a great start in this venture. One of the biggest problems that we have in Anguilla is water, also like my other colleague alluded to, and uh, the cost of water. Gray, gray water systems actually would even help in sustainable development goals, as instead of uh, just using water as it comes in, you actually have a system to uh, recycle your water and use it on the crops that you would have inside your, your um, property. And one of the things I will also propose for that is that uh, it can be leveraged, the cost can be leveraged against uh, property tax for, for the payback. And um, this will be a good way to subsidize water for the, the local person, as we do know that it's subsidized by the government for commercial farming. And uh, this is something that would also help uh, us to feed ourselves, which COVID-19 has proven that needs to happen right away. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Kyle Hodge, you yeah, have a just, chance to report. Just to add, um, sustainable development in the Anguillian context, you know, for me, also has to do with the intangibles, like passing on our culture and our traditions and our skills to the next generation so that they can follow suit. You know, Anguillians are multi-talented people. You know, the older generation, they have been, been, been able to do some of everything. They've sailed the seas, they, they flew the skies. Um, they were owners and, and entrepreneurs and pioneers. So it's about also passing on those, that, that legacy to, from generation to generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We will now move on to the second question. What are the steps necessary for the development of the national energy sector? SDG 7, 11, and 13. What are the ste necessary steps for the development of the national energy sector? SDG 7, 11, and 13. You have one minute to prepare. Okay, I'll just repeat the question one more time. What are the necessary steps, the necessary steps for the development of the national energy sector, SDG 7, 11, and 13? We'll begin with Ms. Gleneva Hodge. Thank you. One of the first steps, and this is going to be a running theme throughout tonight's debate, at least from my perspective, is utilizing our human resource capital. 
within Anguilla, we have persons who are well equipped to manage and deal with our national energy sector. And I will reference a young man, Jibri Lewis, who has already looked at diversifying our um, energy sector. He has looked at not just solar technology, which everyone knows Anguilla if outside of the Saharan dust that we have now, usually Anguilla experiences 368 days of sunlight. However, <laughs> however, you know, he is taking it a step further and we are 35 square miles and we are surrounded by water and he has explored wave technology. And so all of the expertise that we would need to diversify and to develop our energy sector lies within our people. So that's our first step, looking within ourselves and finding the right persons who will push us in that direction. Secondly, uh, maybe this should have been firstly, it would be the willpower to do so. We must recognize that we live in a world where moving away from the traditional fossil fuels is no longer sustainable, no longer is it acceptable, and so moving in that direction, you must have persons who have the willpower to diversify in that area. Thank you, Ms. Hodge. We will now move on to Mr. Kennedy Hodge. Anglec imports roughly $18 million US of, uh, of diesel a year. Uh, to generate roughly 14 megawatts uh, peak electricity every day. The, the price of solar energy is now down to 60 cents a watt. So 14 megawatts, well, if you add on shipping and all that sort of stuff, you can get, you can supply Angola's complete electricity supply with $14 million worth of solar uh, panels, solar plant. However, the sun doesn't shine at night. So you need another $14 million to install wind energy to, to, to provide so that you have both sources. And together, day and night, you will have enough electricity. And the diesel plant will still be there. If you have no wind and no sun, you can power up the diesel plant once in a while. Also, you can have you know, battery technology is advancing at a rapid rate, very rapid rate. And soon, another $10 million would provide enough battery backup to run, to provide electricity from solar and wind when the sun goes down and the wind doesn't blow for a day, maybe two or three days. Tesla just installed a battery pack in, in Australia to provide 100 uh, million watts, 100 mega, uh, megawatts uh, of, of, of electricity backing up uh, solar, solar panels. So it's, it's very, very, doable. What's even better is doable by bringing in the Anguilla population in it. Most of the roofs in Anguilla are concrete roofs. The, uh, you know, the idea of putting a plant down in Karitu and so on is good. Anguilla should have some of his own stuff there. But if you put the panels on everybody's roof and then everybody's involved in a cooperative, again, I've gotten to like cooperatives. I've seen how they work in England. And uh, you involve all the householders in a cooperative, in a joint venture with Anglic. So Anglic builds the, wind, uh, the windmills, the wind farms, and the people have the solar panels on their roof. They're more resistant than hurricanes. I, I see wind, uh, uh, and I don't know why we haven't done it yet. Uh, quite frankly, it's been economical to do this for almost a decade now. And quite frankly, it's very easy to do, and the APM is going to embark on that in a big way uh, once elected. Thank you. Thank you for your response, Mr. Hodge. We'll now move on to Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. First of all, it will take capital to uh, start a, a energy, national energy sector. It will take capital. And if for it to be sustainable, we have to get persons educated in technology for renewables. Uh, one of the things that I keep hearing about uh, solar technology and how it's good for us, which I agree, one of the things that we must consider is that we are in a hurricane belt. 
And we've seen what happened to Anglex uh, solar farm after uh, Hurricane Irma. As also, I've also seen what happened to St. Thomas's um, solar farm after Hurricane Irma. And it was millions of dollars down the drain because of uh, no storage. So be, beyond that as well, it must have storage for a, a system of national uh, energy. And uh, I've seen models where it can be on rollers, where you can actually roll it across a field and you can place it in a building and have it locked down uh, when a hurricane is passing. That is one thing that needs to be done. And um, also for the people of Anguilla uh, to be just informed and be re-informed that solar panels to Anguilla uh, can be duty free. And if you can have it on their roofs, like you see in different places if you travel to the Bahamas and so forth, uh, if you see it on their roofs and it's tied back to the grid, uh, it, will not, it will not give enough energy for Anglic to resell and make a profit um, in terms of what comes back from the, the use of the house, because we must remember that the house itself will consume uh, most of that energy. And, but it will be a way to start the process. And uh, to actually put it in play, Anglic will definitely have to be the pioneer of making um, renewable energies, whichever mode we may take, because of course it's more than just solar. It can be wind, and uh, like my colleague also mentioned, it can be wave energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes, for your response. We'll now hear from Mr. Kyle Hodge. Thank you. Like, uh, like Mr. Hughes said, it's very unfortunate what happened with Anglic, you know, they recently installed that solar field and shortly after Hurricane Irma came and totally devastated it. Um, but our backs are against the walls now, you know, and we have no choice, you know, but to bite the bullet. You know, cost of living is extremely high. Um, the grocery store prices are extremely high and it's all attributed to the cost of energy. You know, cost of operating business as well is very high, so you know we have to to bite the bullet and, and just make the the investment again in going into solar. You know, my colleague Kennedy Hodge, he he went into detail about it. I don't need to res, res, repeat everything that he said, um, but we have to make that investment. But in the interim, what we can do is to make small steps in cutting our overhead, in cutting our costs as a government and as a people. You know, the installation of, of, of LED, LED lights, lights that, that bonds, bonds less current, less current. And, and, and the installation, the installation of, 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 of motion sensors that when you leave a room, you know, the AC would go out or the light would go off. These are, are cost-cutting measures that, that we must implement on the, on the household level and also on the national level. Um, you know, it just, it just helps to reduce costs. And as it relates to, to further reducing costs, um, it's necessary that we also look into to electric vehicles, you know, even from a government standpoint, that that is a good way for, for government to, to lessen the expenses um, on, on the public's purse. Thank you. Thank you for your response, Mr. Hodge. We will now move on to Mr. Mark Romney. Thank you, Madam Moderator. In terms of the steps necessary for the development of the national energy sector, I already alluded to this in my opening statement, but we would need to aggressively migrate to renewable energy. And uh, having said that, the major plank in this is to ensure the implementation of the necessary legislation. Uh, in terms of incentives along the renewable energy path, and Kyle had just um, pointed that out, but I, I j just want to echo it as well, that we should um, create incentives, especially on the likes of electric cars, solar panels, and wind farms, as well as using solar energy for uh, street lighting. I was really um, enthused just yesterday while out doing um, house to house campaigns. I met with a gentleman who's very much on the path of renewables and uh, he has his entire house um, powered by solar energy and his lighting as well on the outside is powered by solar energy. Um, in terms of the, and I noticed you made a reference to the SDG 13 in, um, in, in referencing this. I think what is very important 
is that we integrate uh, climate change measures into our national policies. That is very important. Uh, national policies, strategies, and uh, planning. And we will also have to, um, and I believe my colleague made reference to this, Mr. Hughes, improve the education and awareness raising and human and institutional capacity on climate change, uh, mitigation, adaption, and um, all the warning signs. Bearing in mind, of course, and we are right in the season as it is right now for hurricane season. Therefore, you know, the unfortunate um, occurrence with Anglex loss of this plant, it's very important that the structure that is a solar farm is properly structured and secured. And then on the, in terms of the sustainable um, goal number 11, I think one critical piece of legislation as we forge towards urban development has to be the enactment of the planning bill. I know that created quite a stir before, but we need to recognize that we are at a point of our development where we gotta have the proper zoning um, to ensure that we have uh, the overall full development of our nation. It's very important. Thank you very much. Thank you for your response, Mr. Romney. We will now move into the rebuttal section and we begin with Ms. Blaine Hodge. You have two minutes to rebut. Thank you. I would like to just take us through target five of goal seven, which is affordable energy and clean, affordable and clean energy. And target five states, by 2030, expand infrastructure and upgrade technology for supplying modern and sustainable energy services for all in developing countries, in particular, least development countries and small island developing states. Angola is a small island developing state. And we have to reduce our carbon footprint. And if we don't play our part, like the Prime Minister of Dominica stated immediately after the devastations of hurricanes Alma and Maria in Dominica. At his address to the UN, he said, the Caribbean sits on the front line of climate change. And so the question is, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we, deal, do we continue to utilize fossil fuels or do we move towards re renewable energy, thus reducing our chances of getting another Hurricane Irma, another Hurricane Maria, another Hurricane Dorian. And so no longer can we sit back and say, well, a hurricane will take these things up. We need to put them in place so that we do not see the continuance of such hurricanes. Thank you, Ms. Hodge. Mr. Kennedy, you have two minutes to rebut or add further information. Just, just to, to add, not to rebut anything really. One of the reasons hurricanes do so much damage is the lack of mitigation features in the design. And design. Um, after Hurricane Donna uh, flattened Anguilla, Anguillians switched to a style of building that didn't really suffer major damage in hurricanes. Uh, and then, after we hadn't had any hurricanes for so long, people began to drift back to the nice, fancy-looking houses and architectural digest with the big glass doors and the wide, you know, the wide windows and so on. And then, bam, we got Hurricane Luis, and there was massive damage. Then we got Hurricane Armand, and there was even worse damage. The point is that design can mitigate, substantially mitigate, and uh, the damage that, the potential damage. And it is no different with solar panels. Solar panels, there's all this fancy stuff about putting them up on brackets that you can get the right angle to the sun. We got the sun from all angles, the entire sky. And so forget about that. If you lose 10% efficiency, no big deal. Just bolt the things down to your concrete roof. They're not gonna go anywhere in a hurricane. Something may fly in and smash one or two panels, but you can probably cover them with plywood when you're boarding up your house as well. So the thing is, instead of building big solar farms, we can distribute, it, distribute the solar panels throughout the island on people's roofs. And, uh, and Anglec is gonna be okay, because here's the thing. When you got cheap renewable energy, you can use a lot more. You can air condition every room in your house. 
And so, you know, electric cars, we're going to have to also transition to all electric cars. Those cars are going to use a lot of energy. Uh, but it will be, it won't be costing us a lot, and it's going to be renewable, so we won't be contributing to global warming, and we won't be paying massive prices for it. Thank you. Thank you for your response, our rebuttal, Mr. Kendi. We will now move on to Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Madam, Madam Moderator. It's going to be in two parts, so I'd like to add some more information. Um, I also heard about wave energy uh, as a means of renewables for going forward. And for wave energy, I believe we need to find out what is the effects on our marine life in particular. Um, as we are seeking to explore the fishing industry, we need to know what would wave energy technology do to our marine life. And um, it's also what is the effects on our coastline. Um, we still cannot forget that tourism is our main uh, economic driver. And if you're going to eradicate the coastline, we are talking about lands that uh, we will not be able to realize in sales. So those are two things that I wanted to add, as well as uh, the, the, the debate about renewables, you know, renewables being cheap. Renewables on a startup cost will not be cheap. And there's also down the road, in solar in particular, with inefficiencies that you'll have to address. So it will be more money that it will cost. However, long-term sustainability for the environment purposes Yes, we will have to move to renewable energy, but I just want people to understand that the upfront cost of renewables is not about savings. Thanks. Thank you. We will now move on to Mr. Kyle Hodge. Just to add to, add to um, something that my colleague, Mr. Kennedy Hodge, mentioned, he spoke about um, you know, electric vehicles. You know, I think that, that government would have missed a very good opportunity in the recent purchase of, of some new vehicles to at least perhaps maybe have one or two electric vehicles to have as, as test models going forward because, you know, we're in 2020. We should be looking at ways of which to, to reduce our carbon footprint and to also reduce our cost of operating. So, you know, decision was made. But moving on, um, an APM administration will definitely look into um, having, acquiring renewable um, energy and also um, purchasing electric vehicles to lower the cost of operating for government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We'll now hear from Mr. Mark Romney. Yes, I don't really have much of a rebuttal. I just wanted to add one more um, note, if I should say, in the whole uh, discussion on renewables. I mean, my colleague alluded to it earlier as well in terms of the um, capital costs. And uh, I just want to say that I believe um, what we would need to do is to aggressively look at the necessary funding as well to procure the um, equipment, that is, this for solar energy, whether it's solar, wave, or wind, because we, we do have all three that could be uh, um, available, can be available to us. And as my colleague Gleneva already pointed out, we already had one of our young men, uh, Jibari Lewis, who's a family member, um, already make some great strides towards um, re um, recognizing the advancements that can be deployed with the use of wave energy. I could also say that my son is also very much down that path as well in terms of looking at um, using wave, uh, wave energy. He's also an engineer. But uh, I just wanted to um, come back full circle on the fact that, yes, I believe the whole push should be towards the renewable energy um, migration. And I could tell you this as part of the new AUF administration. I will take a holiday on 30th June, but on 1st July, I will be dealing with the aspects of renewable energy legislation. Thank you. That ends the second question. We'll now move on to the third question. A general reminder to the audience to please remain quiet during the proceedings.
Question three states, trade unions in Anguilla do not have a strong membership base through the ILO. Sorry, I'll reread that. Trade unions in Anguilla do not have a strong membership base, though the ILO promotes these institutions as essential to nation building. What is needed for trade unions in Anguilla to be empowered, and do you see this as a priority? Taken from SDG 8, 10, and 11. I'll reread the question. Trade unions in Anguilla do not have a strong membership base, though the ILO promotes these institutions as essential to nation building. What is needed for trade unions in Anguilla to be empowered, and do you see this as a priority? This question will start with Mr. Kennedy Hodge. You have one minute to prepare. Thank you, candidates. Mr. Hodge will well, take your response. As I, as I said um, in my opening remarks, I was a, a trade union leader at Cable and Wireless. I formed a trade union there. And even though it was eventually disbanded, the staff bargaining unit continued as a very unified body. In my view, trade unions are essential to the protection of workers. They, they are definitely a priority. The employees, employers do not just opt and give employees better salaries and better benefits. It, it doesn't happen. You do have good employers who will treat their workers better than most other employers would. But the fact is that's dependent on the generosity of that particular employer. Uh, em trade unions played a, where they played the dominant role in lifting the standards of, standard of living in Britain. They forced better wages, better living conditions. You, you know, I just trained as a lawyer, and you should see the cases. Guy goes to work in, a, in a, a, a mill factory, and his finger gets chopped off in the saw. And he doesn't get paid for the two weeks he's home recovering, so he has to come back to work. He gets his other finger chopped off. This actually happened, and then he still has got to come back to work. You know, you get an eye knocked out, you've got to come back to work. Trade unions put a stop to all of this callousness. You had to, the machines, the government had to pass proper legislation protecting the workers because of the pressure from the trade unions. In Anguilla, for some reason, we had it in Cable Wireless, we had a unified body, and we stood up and we got everything we asked for. But for some reason, the workers in the hotel sector it may be, uh, I don't know what it is, so I, I wouldn't want to cast aspersions on anybody, but if we could somehow get people together, trade unions are not about destroying the employer, not about destroying the business, because if, if you destroy the business you're working for, then you're out of a job. The idea is to simply work to get the best for both parties, and unless you have an organized trade union led by people who understand the relationships understand what is needed on both sides, and have negotiating skills. You have to negotiate. You can't jump up and just make a big racket, although you just collapse the business. You have to have negotiating skills. One year, I was negotiating for cable and wireless workers, and we negotiated for a year and a half, and we were patient, but we got everything we asked for, and it was backdated the year and a half, so we lost nothing. Trade unions are essential, and Angola needs to get on board with trade unions. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Lacartius, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
Uh, trade unions are definitely needed in Anguilla. Uh, it seeks to provide a relationship, like my colleague said. Uh, but beyond that, uh, a trade union is looking for that level playing field for even the, the voice for the voiceless, which is most of the employees. Um, in Anguilla, it's, it's usually the employer holds the power, and the trade union will seek to balance that. One of the things that I've seen that happen to uh, trade unions in Anguilla that started was there was a component of, of, of money involved, and most people are apprehensive of, of uh, giving part of their salary to a trade union. Um, but it is something definitely that uh, the people of Angola should be even more educated on and how it can be advanced. Um, I've, 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 worked in I've worked in the UK, so I've seen the, the trade unions at, at work. And I can tell you, when an employer sees a trade uh, union, a representative from a trade union coming to a meeting, he is all, um, sh he's all shaken. And he doesn't know which angle they're coming from or what even uh, they're coming to speak about. So definitely, yes, trade unions are needed, and it will definitely seek to protect our people, but it's not going to make the balance one-sided where it's all the employee, employee. It's going to be definitely uh, a, balance, a balance union. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Kyle Hodge, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, what is needed for trade unions in Angola to be empowered? I see it as a priority, definitely, but what is needed for it to happen is simply and practically for people to come together. Um, and the real answer is, is that we have to remove politics from everything in Angola. You know, um, politics is only for a season. It should be only for a four-month, five-month period, but we see in Angola where politics is, is involved in every aspect of, of our life, and we need to know how to separate politics from national development. Um, so it's, it is something that, that once we um, you know, assume office, you know, we, we're gonna definitely look into to, to legislation restricting the length of period that, that we, we campaign and, and we have politics in Angola because it, it just divides us as a people and we need unions and unions need togetherness. Unions need people that, that trust each other. So we have to remove politics from being in every aspect in Angola. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyle Hodge. Mr. Romney, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I do believe firmly in decent work should equal decent pay. And having said that, the reason I believe that the trade unions in Angola do not have a strong membership base has to do with the fact, and that's the elephant maybe in the room, but there is for those unions that were attempted, there always seem to be some level of mistrust amongst the members. And uh, quite often, that has led to the demise, if I should say, of those um, attempts in having um, unions formed. And this has been going on from way back as, um, to the 70s and keep coming forward, and time after time, they fail. One of the... Um, Good things on the horizon, though, that I'll have to say is that I know the um, Minister of Labor has already um, drafted within the um, new labor code the provision for the recognition of trade unions within the labor code relations. And in addition to that, I, I also want to say that when it comes to the trade unions, they are definitely needed because it's not just about ensuring um, better pay in that regard, but you have to look at the better conditions of work, um, in particular when it comes down to um, security at work, because just today I was speaking with a hotel worker and I was very much horrified by the, um, what she revealed in terms of the, the conditions of employment at that particular establishment. Um, it is mind-boggling, but then again, had, the, had we had unions in place, I'm pretty sure that a, a, a formidable union will take on such um, miscarriages, because I, I, that's the only thing I can call it, miscarriages in that regard, and deal with them appropriately. Um, quite often, I know trade unions are seen as problematic, but at the end of the day, 
when it comes down to the rights for workers. I'm very much an advocate for that. My colleague to the left has made mention many times. I did not, but I, if I also had at times sat and on both sides of the table as it relates to um, negoti labor negotiations at Cable and Wireless. So I'm very much familiar with playing it from opposite ends, so to speak. And uh, having said that, I do believe the trade unions are very much needed. And there is the good part is that the enabling legislation is already in progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rumney. Ms. Hodge, you have the floor. Thank you. So the question is, do I see um, enabling trade unions as a priority? And for me, anything that deals with empowering our people and allowing them to have better wages, allowing them to have better working conditions will always be a priority of mine. The reason and one of the reasons that I have heard from persons in terms of why they have not joined trade unions is simply the lack of education surrounding what a trade union can do and should do on behalf of, the, on behalf of its members. In Anguilla, traditionally, it is unfortunate that many of the major employers tend to be, um, I should reverse that, major, the government of Anguilla tends to be beholden to many of the major employers in Anguilla. And therefore, when issues come up between the employer and the employee, many times the government sides on behalf of those who have um, most times financed their campaigns. And therefore, we see the issues surrounding why we cannot get true representation for our people on matters that truly affect them in their working environment. Thank you, Ms. Hodge. No, I'm not sure if Ms. Ms. Hodge was complete in her remarks, but again, this is why it is crucial for the audience to give the candidate enough time to make their statements. So please, I implore you, continue to be respectful, wait for the two minutes, and then you can applaud. Thank you, Mr. Hart. You have the chance to give further information or rebut just your some, opponent's stance. Just, Thank you. just some uh, quick further information. Uh, I so believe in, in trade unions that at my request, my family agreed to give a local uh, trade union right here in Angola free office space for an undefined period of time uh, to help them get going. I, you know, I told them we wouldn't. We would, we probably get around to starting charging maybe a year, two years from now. Unfortunately, uh, again, putting my money where my mouth is when it comes to the, what is benefit for the better bent of Angola, when it comes to things that will better Angola, we were willing to offer free office space to a trade union. And unfortunately, again, it didn't last. The, the, the office shut down. But we just have to keep on rubbing the sticks until one day the spark catches. You know, the, um, and it comes down to each of us, all of us in here, all of us who are involved in Anguilla, doing our personal bit. As a manager at Cable and Wireless, I never allowed any worker to be abused, never allowed any oppressive work conditions to develop. And any report by any staff of any developing danger in the workplace was immediately responded to. It's just the way that we have to contribute to protecting our, our workers. Uh, if all of us play our bit in the interim until we get uh, you know, strong trade unions, we can at least try to mitigate uh, the, the situations that workers in Angola face. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Hughes, you have a chance to rebut or share further information on the topic. You have two minutes to respond. Sure. Uh, just firstly, I see Eddie in the crowd, and I remember he'd had a lot of work on a trade union at one point in time. 
And um, his efforts, uh, the long days, I know that it took for him. And what I tried to, to shape the framework and even get people on board. Uh, he is someone that I know that is very, very much, when he gets to a task, he sticks to the task. And um, so I'll have to even dialogue with him a little better to find out what was his issues there so as we can move forward with farm and trade unions. And I also want to thank Deniva for, for letting me know about the finance campaign issue. And now I understand why the AUF doesn't have a campaign running on steroids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Kyle Hodge, you have the floor. You have two minutes to respond. We can move on. Okay, Mr. Respond. Yeah. No, we, I, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Ms. Hodge, you have the floor. Thank you. First, me, let me apologize to the audience. You know, I paused in my, my response simply because I recognized that some of the statements and comments that I was going to make following were better suited for a rebuttal based on the rules presented. I am thankful that um, my fellow candidate, Mr. Lacarte Hughes, pointed out Ali in the audience with us. And I have been grateful to be able to spend some time in speaking with Ali on the issues of trade unions. And so I can appreciate the resistance that is there to trade unions. And one of those issues, and it's unfortunate that the legislation is still only being drafted and is not put in place. Um, when it comes to protections for trade unions. This is something that should have been dealt with a very long time ago, and it is unfortunate that at this point we are still speaking about it being drafted. I believe someone mentioned, uh, um, a fellow candidate also mentioned that trade unions are problematic, but I'm going to leave him with a rhetorical question. Problematic for whom? And before I go, there was also, and I just wanted to clarify something that I believe Kyle said in terms of politics. And just to clarify that there's a huge difference between politics and partisan politics. And until we can get clear on the fact that politics affects every aspect of our life, but it is the partisan politics that has divided us as a country. Thank you. <laughs> We'll now move on to the final question, question number four. It reads, within this COVID-19 climate, international travel has been discouraged. If elected, what plans are essential to jumpstarting Angola's tourism product? Taken from SDGs 4, 8, 10, and 11. I'll repeat the question. Within this COVID-19 climate, international travel has been discouraged. If elected, what plans are essential to jumpstart an Anguilla's tourism product? It's taken from SDG 4, 8, 10, and 11. You have one minute to prepare. Thank you, candidates. We'll begin with Mr. Hughes. You have three minutes to respond. Oh, thank you, Madam, Madam Moderator. 
Well, for Anguilla and uh, tourism, and needing to jumpstart, what's needed to jumpstart uh, tourism after COVID-19 is that we have now made Anguilla a safe zone, thanks to our health professionals. We are, we are able to boast that we are a safe zone. And we do also have the adequate, adequate testing needed at the ports. And for this to, to come in, in, um, in cohesion, uh, we will have to promote Anguilla now as a safe zone. And there, we've, been, we've been blessed to have a tourism product that has, has been on the luxury end. So we do have um, travelers that operate in this sphere that, that have disposable income. So they will pay for luxury at a, at a premium level. Um, so that's, that's the good thing that Anguilla is in that space. Uh, we do have new niche markets that we must explore as well, and therefore the jump started in that farm. But coming back to, to being in the sphere of luxury, uh, we do have private jets that can land on Anguilla uh, tomorrow. Just will take the, the COVID-19 testing and the protocols for the person to disembark. Uh, one of the things too that we'll have to look at is our villa sector. This is gonna be crucial to this jump starting of, of travel in Anguilla. Uh, it's gonna be able to have the tourist quarantine um, to a certain degree because of the villa aspect to it. And um, technology is gonna play a big role as well in how uh, we move forward in this jump start because uh, we're gonna have to use more app application bases to cut down as, as much as possible human interaction, uh, which is going against what tourism is. But in, in COVID-19, it definitely says that uh, we'd have to limit much interaction with human beings um, as they come in. So I feel um, going forward and pretty, pretty soon as well, uh, with the protocols of open our borders, and we have one of the best testing machines that is on the market today. Uh, it's all giving us the ability to jumpstart our tourism product uh, right away. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Kyle Hodge, you have yes. the floor. Yes, thank you. You know, everything, everything hinges on our, our medical facility and our ab ability to respond to, to any patient or any, any tourist that might come in sick. But you know, even prior to COVID-19, you know, I, I was recently made aware that, that tourists usually you know, call Anguilla's, whatever hotline it is, to find out about our medical um, capabilities. So even now with COVID you know, being a problem, it's, it's, it's even more burdensome that, that our hospital is, is, is you know, still trying to, to catch up. Um, you know, it's, it's gonna involve rapid testing. It's gonna involve um, making sure that we have the equipment on hand, ventilators, um, areas where we, can, where we can quarantine. And it's already available, I believe. So, you know, the, the COVID response has been really good. I must give kudos to, to the ministry and, and those who are handling it to get us to this position. So like Mr. Hughes said, um, the private jets coming back into Angola is definitely a start. You know, we, we, we are um, a luxury tourism product. So those, those people can start returning to Anguilla. And you know, that's the way to go. So I, I have nothing else to add to that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your response, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Mark Romney, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. The new normal, as we say, we have to live with COVID. And um, one of the great um, facts as it relates to Anguilla is that we have moved from no sporadic cases to no cases. And there are very few countries around the world that have that status. As a matter of fact, I believe it's only three. And uh, this declaration was made by the World Health Organization. So that, I think, is just great recognition to the government of Angola for really managing so well the COVID response. Uh, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Hughes, already alluded to, in terms of the um, controlled reopening, I, I believe that with the villa sector, we can obviously immediately respond in that need, um, in that regard, in terms of our tourism um, advancement and getting our persons back to work. We already have the jet travel that is, uh, Angola's already known for, 
And I just want to, at this point, in particular, recognize the, um, the, the great work of Lloyd's Aviation as they are now getting ready to construct a new terminal at the um, Clayton J. Lloyd International. In terms of managing the, the health aspects of it, we already have in place the testing equipment. That's why um, we are able to have that um, ability to really welcome the, the, um, the, the jet travel back. And um, you know, it's really great when you really consider the fact that even though we haven't had any um, cases in terms of um, the need for the, to, to use the facility at the hospital, but all the necessary equipment is there in terms of the necessary uh, ventilators and what have you, and a complete isolation unit that has uh, the capability to accommodate up to 10 patients. I mean, you consider our population size versus some of the other countries or some of our neighbors, they were not even in a position to accommodate half of that amount. So in all, I, I believe that we have done a remarkable job in dealing with the COVID response. And uh, having said that, with the social distancing, this is gonna be the new way on international travel. We have to be prepared to recognize that the cost of air travel will increase given the fact that there will be a limited number of seats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Romney. Mr. Miss, sorry, Glenniva <laughs> Hodge, you can respond. Thank you. As it relates to jump-starting our tourism product, there's absolutely no need to reinvent the wheel. We can simply look at the Antigua model in terms of how they have gradually reopened their sector. And I am thankful that my fellow candidates have alluded to the fact that we do enjoy um, a luxury tourism sector with persons who have a higher level of disposable income. Therefore, it also means that we can charge persons coming in for testing. So you're not just going to be coming in and be given a free test. We can make some money. Now, <laughs> testing is very important because despite President Trump claiming that if we reduce testing, um, the negative results, will, the, the positive results will not be there. Testing, testing, testing is important. We cannot afford to go down that, um, that road of destroying the hard work of the health officials in the Ministry of Health in getting us to this point where we are at. I, I don't know of many persons, and I, I should say, there are many persons right now who have returned to Angola and they're in quarantine, and tonight, I can truly say that I understand the difficulty in being quarantined and away from persons as I too had to deal with that. In addition to the villa sector that persons have already spoken about, there's the untapped um, luxury marine sector when we look at those persons who own their own um, cruise ships and those luxury yachts. And there's absolutely no reason why we cannot begin to open up to those persons again, utilizing testing, the rapid testing, and ensuring that we do it in a manageable and very responsible way that does not look and seek to overcrowd our um, health services, and that whatever we do, that we keep the Anguillian public and the health of the Anguillian public at the forefront of any initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hodge. We will now move on to Mr. Kennedy Hodge. Well, we have to open our borders at some point in time. Uh, I've actually heard some people uh, scolding uh, here the other day, uh, here today, as to why the governor extended the, the lockdown, the border closure from June 30th to July 14th. Uh, and that's part of the problem is we also are not getting much information as to why these decisions are being made, whether or not 
we agree with them, we are not getting information as to why these decisions are being made, what are the pros and cons, what factors went into the thinking uh, that gives us, that came up with these decisions. The question obviously is how can we open up uh, to tourism safely or relatively safely because it there may not be any such thing as safely anymore. Well, private jets and villas, I would say, uh, are the key words. Uh, and exploiting our status as a COVID-19 free zone, tourists can arrive on private jets, go straight to villas, uh, where we, we can exploit the fact that we have, a lot of our tourism is based on separate, standalone, single family villas. So tourists arrive on a private jet, a family, they go to a villa, they can uh, eat in restaurants which have lots of space. Uh, our beaches are virtually empty, even at the height of our tourist season. So we can take advantage of our space. Uh, however, we have to be aware of something that's happening in our major market. Uh, COVID-19 is on the verge of getting out of control in the U.S., where most of our tourists comes from. Uh, the press there is referring to it as a, 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 a forest fire starting. The U.S. is now reporting more cases than ever before, and the EU is reportedly about to ban any visitors from the U.S. coming to the EU uh, until they get it under control. If the U.S. does not get COVID, does not move, because they're apparently not even moving to get it under control, by, by the time November comes around, we can kiss goodbye to our upcoming tourist season. But we hope that this does not happen. We don't have any control, any say in it. But if it doesn't happen, again, we exploit our spaced out tourism product. Large restaurants, plenty of room, uh, empty beaches, single family villas, and we can, we can adapt our tourism product to meet the new reality so long as that new reality lasts. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move into the rebuttal section. We'll begin with Mr. Hughes. As a general reminder to the candidates, you have a maximum of two minutes to, re to rebut or add further information on the topic. You can begin. Thank you, Madam, Madam Moderator. Uh, on a rebuttal to Glenever with the uh, notion of, of bringing in mega yachts to Anguilla, I'm a bit apprehensive in that market is for right now because there's going to be take a lot of uh, money to police a mega yacht from disembarking the vessel and so, and so forth. So I'm not ready for that as yet. I don't think Anguilla is ready for that as yet. The villa segment can be ready because you do have the personality to police the, the villa compound relatively easy. So that's why I spoke of villas. And one other part that I would like to add to the discussion is that uh, there needs to be an uh, education uh, session for also staff returning to these uh, workplaces because they need to understand how to deal with COVID-19 and how to deal with the psyche, the psyche that comes with it going forward. Um, they, I remembered when COVID was in our shores, I remember the widespread panic that it, it carried in this, this sector. And there were people that did not want to service um, our, our guests. So I can see going back in, we'll have to have that conversation and those protocols fleshed out, as well as an education system for them to deal with our tourists. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Kyle Hodge, yeah. you may respond. Thank you. As, as you follow the news, you know, you realize that that there's a second wave that might be approaching. And it just emphasizes the need for us to, to diversify our markets. You know, um, our current market is, is the northeast part of the United States. So there's a, there's a need right now, immediately, to diversify into markets that were not hit as hard as, as those markets. Um, I read an article recently where one of the Caribbean islands um, one of their plans for reopening included to, to open to, to regional tourism and also um, travelers from those countries. They would have been, they, they should have been on the island for at least, I think, 30 days 
before being able to travel to that country. So those are the kind of restrictions that we will have to put in place in the meantime as we think about reopening, where, who we're going to open to, and what type of um, restrictions as to movement of people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Mark Romney. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. I just want to make a very important observation as it relates to the whole uh, aspect of reopening. And, um, and my colleague made mention of following the Antigua model. That, that is um, fraught with some risk. And I say that on the basis that we still have to follow those guidelines as it relates to the quarantine period. And it's not likely that you're going to get a hotel traveler or international traveler wishing to come and then be told he'll have to be in quarantine, he or she that is, quarantine for 14 days, for example. Um, whereas with the controlled reopening that we're, we're speaking of as it relates to the villas, these persons, um, quite a few of them are actually owners and at the same time, most of these folks, they want to get away from their quote unquote other home to come to their preferred home and they want to come for as long as three to six months because uh, of the, the, the fear back in those uh, markets uh, which are really considered the hot spots. So having said that, it, it, it gives us in terms of the, the long stay revenue um, potential that we could um, recognize from the, the villa market. And as I said before, these people, most of them, they already have their jets ready to come. It's just a question of when. So, then when I say when, in terms of making the trip across, but when it comes to international uh, commercial travel, that is another um, discussion. And as I said before, it does present a very high level of risk, especially when it comes to those persons coming from those hotspots. And uh, we, for example, the UK is getting ready to possibly impose a travel ban and persons coming out of the United States. So this is the dynamics that are currently at play. Thanks very much. Thank you for your response, Mr. Romney. Ms. Glenevo Hodge, you have the floor. Thank you. So when I spoke about the Antigua model, it was mostly in reference to the fact that the charge for testing. Um, beyond that, however, if we look even in Jamaica, um, I would have done it just to see how they do it, where they pre-fill a form and they do, so you'd have to be tested prior to coming to Jamaica and then you are tested again if you are cleared to travel to Jamaica. So testing again remains the important factor in all of this. One of the areas that I would have noted um, just before I got here, I saw a news item where the U.S. is claiming that there may possibly be a vaccine available um, in early 2021. But what do we do in the meantime? And it is at this point, and Kyle alluded to this a little bit earlier in terms of looking at um, exploring different markets. And one of the markets that we have not tapped into in Anguilla is the regional market. Throughout the region, we've seen um, a lot of countries working really hard at keeping their COVID numbers down. And so if, when we see in the fall, when tourism would usually be opening back up, and our regional counterparts have been able to get COVID-19 under control, then that is an area that we can continue to exploit. I know many persons are looking to Anguilla with our one-day summer festival carnival and wishing that they could be here right now, and that's an opportunity that we have. But beyond that, with my last few seconds, I want to say that this COVID-19 has highlighted the reason we need to diversify beyond tourism. If Alma didn't teach us, COVID-19 taught us. And I am saying that on June 29th, when you elect me, I can tell you how it is that we should diversify our economy so that we do, are not thank dependent you, on- Thank you, Ms. Hodge. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy Hodge, you have two minutes to rebut or add for the information. Well, tourism, there's no question, tourism brings in the dollars to fuel our economy. 
But fishing also brings some money into our economy, a not insignificant amount. Much smaller, but money nonetheless. The government's decision to shut down and subsequently limit our fishing industry is unfathomable. Not only should it not have been shut down, facility, facilities should have been put into place to assist the continued export of fish to neighboring St. Martin, St. Martin. Our economy is now plumb out of money, and fish exports to St. Martin would have been bringing in at least a few dollars, just something to keep circulating. I hear the cries of the people. I get called every day, all day. People have no money, no food in their houses. And if the fishermen had been allowed to export fish, which could have been easily done, the cargo boats ran to St. Martin throughout, have been running to St. Martin throughout the border closure. They could have been carrying fish, exporting fish, and this fishermen could have been, played a, a, a role in helping to sustain our population. We have a lockdown, border closure. You can't just take a productive sector of the economy that was actually not at all impacted by COVID and shut it down. Uh, and you know, <laughs> I, I won't say anything more. It, uh, it should not have happened. And our fishermen were robbed of the chance of playing a bigger role to help the people of Anguilla. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. We'll come to the end of our prepared questions. We'll now begin with asking one question due to the interest of time from the audience. So in this section, the candidates will be given two minutes to answer questions from the audience with a minute uh, for rebuttal, if so desired. So I'll ask the question, feel it from the audience. And we will start with Mr. Kyle Hodge. Once I've read the question, you'd have a minute to prepare. The question is, what are the challenges of health and well-being that are a hindrance to sustainable development? I'll repeat the question. What are the challenges of health and well-being that are a hindrance to sustainable development? You have one minute to prepare. Thank you, candidates. Now we'll begin with Mr. Kyle Hodge. You have two minutes to respond. Thank you for the question. You know, health is, health is definitely wealth. Um, the health of, of the nation definitely will, will determine how we can, we, can, we can go forward leading this country in a, in a good way. Um, growing healthy, living healthy programs, these are programs that, as a government, we need to to take charge of, especially in our agricultural sector, being able to, to grow our own food, you know, it determines you know, how healthy we are and it determines our diet and our nutrition. So as a, as a government and as a country, like I said earlier, the need to reduce our, our reliance on imported products, imported food, imported meats, because these things, when, when they ship from wherever they, they come from, the, the time in which they are shipping, it, the quality deteriorates. So health is definitely important as it relates to, to sustainable development in Angola and moving forward as a healthy country. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Kyle Hodge. Mr. Mark Romney, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, in terms of the challenges for health and well-being, the, I believe the most critical aspect of that is for us to really embark upon the implementation of a national health fund. Um, in so doing, we'll be able to provide more ready care for the vulnerable in our society. When I speak of the vulnerable, I'm making specific, specific reference to the elderly uh, on the one uh, end of the spectrum, and on the other end of the spectrum, uh, young, the, the young persons. So there's really a need for, for a national health fund. Having said that, when you consider the increased um, incidence of um, the NCDs here in Anguilla, it is quite alarming um, in terms of uh, non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and the like, and we also have an issue with obesity. I believe we need to promote healthy living, proper diets. Uh, we certainly need more green areas for recreational activity or exercise. Move Your Body, for example, is an initiative that was done, and we um, encourage persons to exercise at least three times a week. My wife is an exercise fanatic. She does it daily. I will also say that um, it is important for us to recognize that in promoting uh, good health and well-being, it's a, the whole uh, dietary needs we really need to pay attention to. In Angola, some people say it's a cultural habit. I, I don't believe it is uh, something that if we really recognize the harmful effects when uh, some of our people really love to eat certain type foods, especially the likes of um, very salted pigtail and so on. Um, we need to cut back on the salt intake um, in particular and Thank really you, ensure Mr. Romney. balanced diets. Your time is up. Thank you. Ms. Glenniva Hodge, you have the floor to respond. Thank you. We began by talking about the cost of living, and we must recognize that the cost of living has a direct correlation um, to access to healthy foods. Persons will say, well, it's cheaper to eat right than to go to the doctor. The fact of the matter is, is if you have a person who have $20 in their hand and they are expected to feed their family for the week, they're more likely to go and purchase some macaroni and cheese and some sausage than they are to go and buy just carrots and broccoli. So we must be able to address um, access to healthy foods and whether or not our cost of living can support um, the, access, the access to healthy foods. Additionally, and um, my fellow candidates would have spoken about the need for green spaces. And the need for green spaces um, speaks to ensuring that we have spaces where persons can safely exercise without bearing the additional cost of gyms. I know we have several gyms, but again, when we speak about the cost of living, um, this must be taken into consideration. And most importantly, it is something that is very taboo and that we do not speak about but we must be able to address the mental health of our people if we are going to speak about the health and wealth of a nation. A healthy mind is just as important as a healthy body. And so mental health and addressing substance abuse within our um, society is something that must, emphasis must be placed on. Thanks, Ms. Glenniva Hodge. Mr. Kennedy Hodge, you have the floor to respond. One of the, Anguilla has one of the longest lived populations in the world. I am told that if Anguilla was an independent country, we would rank amongst the top countries in terms of life expect expectancy. Having said that, our rate, the rate of increase of non-communicable disease in Anguilla is worrying. Education of the people has to play a key role in addressing this. People's habits, the way people eat, uh, the way the lifestyles can be shifted by carefully targeted education. Universal health care 
is an important uh, part of a good healthcare system. We must have a, a system of care for our elderly and our very young, uh, at, at, at the very least. And, you know, uh, the levy was supposed to be for that. Affluence impacts on the healthiness of the food that people buy. Anguilla has been getting poorer and poorer. Poverty and hunger are increasing, even apart from the impact of COVID, the coronavirus pandemic, and people are just not buying, able to afford to buy healthy food. And finally, let me say this. The APM's leader, Dr. Ellis Lorenzo Webster, has been speaking about ideas, ways of fixing our health system till he's blue in the face. And nobody in authority has been listening. Is now you have the chance, the people of Anguilla have the chance to elect him to office so that he can actually do it. All the others have failed. It's time to give him the chance. Let him succeed or fail, but you will not know until you give him the chance. The others who have been doing it before have already Thank you. failed. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Lockhart Hughes, you have the floor to respond. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, for me, the first step to healthy uh, well-being starts with prevention. And prevention comes through education of, of, of what, what is basic food groups that you would eat or digest in one meal. Um, I used to be very much active in, in, in the gym. And gymming and eating, pro eating correctly goes hand in hand. So our people must understand what are the, effect, the long-term effects of not eating a proper diet, a balanced diet. So start with education, like I said. Now, before I go any further, though, I want to also say kudos to the Chronic Disease Unit uh, for the campaigns they have had implemented. Like my colleague said, Move Your Body was one. Uh, there was a biggest, bigger, biggest loser as well. I think they partnered with that as well. So uh, they have been on campaigns trying to move to the, the, from the preventative uh, measures um, for which non-communicable diseases like hypertension and diabetes would plague the body at some point in time. Um, also, I'm seeing going forward that there is a, a thrust around the, the region uh, because World Health Organization had, and had the region at about 14.5% uh, obese rate. And there are movements around the region banning sweet uh, foods from the sales in schools and even from in schools itself. So these are things that I believe I will have to venture on as well to, to promote um, well-being for our kids firstly, because they, they eventually will build the, the future um, nation that will be a healthy one. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Now that, our, that all our candidates have responded to the question, we now will move into the rebuttal section where uh, candidates will have a chance to address their opponents directly and they're giving or share further information on the topic. They're given one minute to do so. Mr. Hodge, we can start with you. Thank Kyle you. Hodge, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, you know, just to add, dealing with healthcare, we must deal with it from the root and not the branch. Um, it's, it's definitely, it's gonna be cheaper for us to, to invest in preventative healthcare methods you know, when we look at um, wellness programs, like my colleagues talked about, um, but it also involves continuous health screening and also continuous education. And we have to utilize our schools and our churches to definitely get the message across that prevention is definitely better than, than cure. Thank you, Mr. Kyle Hodge, Mr. Mark Romney. You have the floor. Yeah, not necessarily a rebuttal, but uh, as I said um, earlier, alluded to as well, I believe there is definitely the need for much more awareness amongst our population in terms of the, you know, what is needed in terms of um, good health and well-being. I find that, uh, especially at our schools, and I'm very much um, happy to know that with our new schools that are being built in terms of the, the cafeterias that are now going to be a feature of those schools, and I believe that is a good place for us to start in ensuring that our children have the proper meals um, instead of, you know, really drinking all of these sodas and uh, the other um, snacks that they tend to partake. Uh, I believe children are the best messengers in getting that 
message across because I know ch children tend to place people um, at that point of their consciousness. And I strongly believe that with that um, initiative, we will see the uh, better development of... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Romney. I think your clock is faster for me. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Glenniva Hart, you have the floor to share further information or rebut your opponent's stance. Thank you. So I am happy to hear from both Mark and Lacarte um, in terms of speaking about the foods that are available to our school children. And to Mark, I would um, have to say, I hope that these cafeterias don't stay empty like the one that is currently at AARPS. It has been there for quite some time, um, and the cafeteria has been there, and it has not been utilized. So having buildings and keeping them empty is what not. In addition, I do not provide, um, I don't propose issues without being able to address solutions to them. And so in order to be able to fund um, lowering the cost of healthcare for the most vulnerable in our society. We can look at including a luxury tax on some of the items that are high in sugar, high in alcohol, and to ensure that that tax is not sent into the consolidated fund, but is directed directly towards getting to the persons who are most in need and those most vulnerable Thank in our you, society. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy Hodge, you have the floor. Yeah. It, is, it is folly to expect to keep doing the same thing and expect different results from it. The APM has an innovative, a completely different approach, a radical approach to our health system. Dr. Ellis, our leader, Dr. Ellis Lorenzo Webster, as I said before, and I just reiterate, he has been expounding on this for a long time now. It's up to the people of Angola to say we want a better health system and we, know, and we know that the APM can do it and will do it. We ask the people of Angola to elect us, to give us the chance to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy Hodge. Mr. Lockhart Hughes, you have the floor to yes. share further information or your yes. rebuttal. So just to add a little bit more, um, I spoke earlier about access to good produce is one issue that we have. And one of the measures that I, that I spoke about earlier was recycling gray water systems. Because we have to be honest about agriculture in Angola. One of the biggest issues is water. It is not in abundance and it's very costly. So for us to, to, to grow subsistence, for us for subsistence to go forward, we have to think about ways of, of getting our people to grow and how we can assist them in adventure. Like I said about the gray water systems, it can always be leveraged towards uh, a house tax of some kind so they can realize the, the cost of it through other different saving methods. Thanks. Thank you for your responses. We'll now move into the segment, which is the closing remarks from each candidate. You have three minutes to give your remarks. We can begin with Mr. Mark Romney. So I thought I was not due up yet, but anyway, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. <laughs> First of all, I wish to thank the audience um, for your presence here this evening, as well as those of you listening and viewing from the comfort of your home. And I, I trust that the discussion here this evening would have given you much more information and more so that will help you towards making that big decision on, this, on the 26th and the 29th as it relates to decision 2020. Having said that, I just want to really re-emphasize the importance of having some love and unity during this campaign. It has become, and we've had it echoed here from this platform in, um, this evening, in terms of the divisiveness that has seemed to have um, really crept 
into the um, campaign. It has got to a point at times, it is mind boggling, but be that as it may, when it comes to me, I, my shoulders are very broad. I take whatever they throw. But at the end of the day, uh, whatever the decision is on election day, I just trust that we will accept the will of the people. Um, having said that, I also want to just say that um, in terms of my decision to enter the political arena, arena in terms of what really propelled me is that I, in terms of my vision, which is simply to make life better for all Anguillians in an environment, in an environment fostered by unity and love for each other. Maintaining a sustainable economy, advanced social and cultural development with full autonomy by 2035. In terms of what qualifies me, having served some 30 years with cable and wireless corporate experience within the telecoms industry and served as general manager and I head, headed all the, divi the various divisions in sales and marketing, customer service and finance within the organization and bringing with me key skills in communication, teamwork, strategic planning, interpersonal skills and problem, and problem solving. I am a very compassionate, honest and caring person a very trustworthy individual. I fully embrace the core values of honesty and respect, accountability and responsibility, which all are essential for public life. The clock didn't run out this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your closing remarks, Mr. Romney. We will now move on to Ms. Gleneva Hodge. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening you would have heard from five of the 15 candidates contesting in the island-wide race in the upcoming election. The choice is yours. Choose persons who have demonstrated not just an in-depth knowledge of the issues facing our country, but who have provided you with sound solutions. Choose candidates who are willing to put country above self and have a proven track record of service to others even outside of public office. Choose persons who have committed to campaign finance laws and who do not need the laws in place to do the right thing. I have committed to publishing my campaign finances and that way there will be no baseless accusations in terms of who owns me in government. Our country is crying out for healing and we desperately need uniting. Tonight, I chose to wear green because the nursery rhyme blue and yellow mixed together makes green was floating around in my head as a reflection of the way forward for our country. United we stand, divided we fall. So I am urging you on June 26th and 29th, cast away the division of parties and colors and anchor your ballots. Vote for hope. Vote for stability. Vote for Gleneva Hodge, the anchor. Thank you. Thank you for your closing remarks, Ms. Hodge. Mr. Kennedy Hodge. I hear about youngest people to hold positions. I was senior technician over Angola's telephone system at 18 and head of engineering of Cable and Wireless Angola at 23, the youngest ever person to hold that top engineering position in a Cable and Wireless branch worldwide. But my age did not matter. What mattered is that I did the best possible job in the position God placed me in. What impresses is what one did in a job, whether young or old, not having, not having attained the position young and being unable to point to any achievements in the job. Jesus started his ministry at 30, and by 33, he was done and gone. We don't need people hanging around for 40 years and achieving nothing except putting us all into ever-increasing debt, destroying our institutions and way of life, and raising taxes. With your support, I will start representing you at age 62, 
And the things I expect to leave you with in five years include transparent participatory government, transformation to 100% renewable energy, proper sports facilities for our youth, and quality of life enhancing facilities for our elderly, a dramatically expanded fishing industry, vastly increased local food production using advanced agricultural technology, deployed in a wide, on a wide scale in all districts, a more affluent standard of living and fair pay, reduction in the cost of living, major increase in scholarships and training, and significantly increased improved infrastructure, including more paved roads so that our people are not living in dust bowls. Focusing on the SDGs achieves these objectives, but in Angola we have seen no political will to address virtually any of them. Take one, poverty, and two, hunger. Our leadership says Angola is blessed, we are in a good place, despite clear evidence that our people are struggling and poverty and hunger are increasing. So obviously there is no political will to improve the situation. Clean water and sanitation, how can there be political will when the leadership boasts that we have 24-7 water, which is not the case. Affordable and clean energy, we are being impoverished by the high cost of energy, yet our leadership has not sought to transition to cheaper renewable energy. Justice and peace, our government lacks transparency. Lack of transparency is weakening our institutions. Government is the perpetrator of injustice in numerous cases. Our young men are imprisoned for marijuana spliff and a citizen has been charged with sedition even though our administering power has abolished the offense as suppression of freedom of speech. But change is coming. The APM has the skill to achieve these goals, the will to achieve them, and we will achieve them. I ask that you give us a chance to achieve for you what the current government has failed to do for 15 of the last 20 years and vote APM on June 26th and 29th. God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Hodge, for your closing remarks. Mr. Mark, Mr. <laughs> Blackheart Hughes. Yes. Thank you, Madam, thank you, Madam Moderator and Mr. Moderator for having me here this evening. It was indeed a pleasure to discuss the issues facing our beloved Anguilla and their connection to the globe. I hope that my participation added value to our quest in becoming a more sustainable nation as outlined in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. What has stood out to me is the importance education on various levels carries to the realization of these goals. With that in mind, I would like to suggest that the Anguilla National Youth Council regularly champion more debates on the SDGs in particular, and not just confine them to an election cycle. These SDGs will determine uh, whether or not our Earth will be livable in the future, and to reverse the ill effects, we all must adhere to the conservation methods today. I look forward to working with the Angola National Youth Council, uh, that is on after June 29th, as I believe that the youth time to lead is both now and in the future, and I implore you to stay in the blessed place. Thanks. We'll now hear from our final candidate, Mr. Kyle Hodge. Thank you for the opportunity of allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be a voice for you, the citizens of Angola, especially the young people. Thank you to all those who believed in me. This is how I repay you, by offering my services to the creation of a better Angola. I understand that over the years, you may have lost hope in those who have led you, but I am here to say that hope has returned. I am here to let you know that Anguilla can rise once again, but this will take a united, concerted effort. This will take vision and focus. This will take determination and resolve. And this is what the Anguilla Progressive Movement offers you. This is what I offer you. The future is fast approaching, and we have to be prepared. We have to prepare ourselves to welcome it. We need to evolve with the times so as to not be left behind. And to do that, we must ourselves become more inclusive 
so that no one of our citizens are left behind. To our Spanish-speaking citizens, we are ready to cement your place in this community. Seramos tu vos. Nosotros te representamos. Vota el bote in el día de las elecciones. Vota azul. Angola is ready to cast off the coat of dependency and step into self-sufficiency. The youth are ready to take our seat at the table of decisions. I am ready to fight for change, for present and for future generations. And the Anguilla Progressive Movement is ready to take Anguilla into the next era. William Faulkner let us know that you cannot swim for new horizons until you have courage to lose sight of the shores. So on the 26th of June and on the 29th of June, as we look towards new horizons in Angola, I want you to be brave. I want you to play your part in bringing change to Angola because change can't wait. Thank you very much, Mr. Kyle Hodge. And by extension, I would like to thank the other candidates, Mr. Mark Romney, Ms. Gleneva Hodge, Mr. Kennedy Hodge, and Mr. Lockhart Hughes for your presence tonight and your willingness to partake in these debates. Can the audience please give them another round of applause? Thank you all for, thanks also to our audience and our virtual audience for tuning in to listening to these debates. Thank you for your questions. Have a safe and blessed night. Good night. <laughs>